Steve. <laughs> And uh, I've got a, a guest in the green room who's laughing away because they can hear us uh, and hear me uh, and realise that I was uh, not quite there. But anyway, let's get into it. Let's not chit-chat around too much. Um, yeah, so Toolbox Tech Talk today is all about earth fault alarms and uh, – the, the requirements in our PVRA, our battery standard, and our grid inverter standard, all of those uh, standards um, tie in with the requirements for an earth fault alarm. So I'm going to do a little brief explainer with my usual overhead drawings, um, and then I'm going to bring in a guest, and we're going to talk about some actual products. So let's dive into it. So first up, um, the question really that comes up is, um, why do we need an earth fault alarm uh, at all. What's the, what's the problem? So the problem is that uh, we've, got, we've got a system here using a maximum PowerPoint tracker. Now, a maximum PowerPoint tracker, and I should probably zoom in a little bit, a little bit more. Here we go, um, to make that a bit clearer and move that over there. Maximum PowerPoint tracker is a DC-DC conversion device and also something that operates um, generally either a PV array or other um, devices with variable impedance uh, uh, at the optimum power point. And so, you know, hence the word maximum power point tracker, MPPT. Now, this symbol for it here is DC-DC conversion. And this is a non-separated MPPT. Now, that's really important in terms of earth fault alarm requirements. A non-separated MPPT is one that has no galvanic separation. Um, now, it may be that one or other of the poles are connected directly through. So you might have the negative um, conductor is passed through uninterrupted, or you might have the positive conductor that's passed through uninterrupted. And when it's operating, it's switching electronics that's doing the conversion. It's not actually a an isolation, a galvanic isolation. So the problem that we get with um, this arrangement is that, let's take this scenario here, um, we've got a battery, let's call it a 48 volt battery, so it's less than 60 volts, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. So let's say we've got a, a 48 volt battery here, uh, notionally that's uh, in the old terminology extra low voltage, but as you'll see when we talk about um, inverter standards uh, and battery standards, sorry, the battery standard now deems anything over 60 volts for more than 0.2 of a second under any operating or fault condition to be uh, a, a hazardous voltage level. So hazardous voltage now for battery systems is dropped right down to 60 volts. So we might think we've got, we're below 60 volts, so it's got a lower um, protection requirement. But because we don't have that galvanic separation um, between the array, and in this case the array is operating at LV, it's operating above 120 volts. And so at over 120 volts, we've now got the possibility that if there was an earth fault here, the voltage measured on the battery positive to earth or the PV array uh, positive to earth is the same because there is no galvanic separation. So suddenly the battery port has been raised to an LV level. And that's a hazardous situation. So in the case of a non-separated MPPT, uh, we need to have an earth fault alarm uh, uh, because that potential can exist. So that's, that's a non-separated MPPT. And you might be asking me, um, you know, what's the norm? Well, actually, the norm is non-separated MPPT. So they're pretty common. Let's look at the next slide. And here we've got a... Uh, a separated MPPT. Now, not so common. Um, in fact, uh, I, my guest might be able to tell me, uh, I'm just flagging this one, which ones do have uh, galvanic separation that are on the market in Australia. But uh, if, the dove, if it does have galvanic separation, I've shown it like it's got a isolating transformer inside. That means the electrons on the PVRA side can't cross over to the electrons uh, on the battery side. And therefore, the battery's voltage determines the voltage at V2 and the PV array voltage at V1. So in this case, if we have an earth fault on this side, um, we're not going to see a high voltage um, or the PV array voltage appear uh, on the battery port. We're only going to see the, the maximum voltage of the battery. But on the PV array side, we still have an LV PV array. And so an earth fault on this side if it's over 120 volts, we're required to have a galvanic, uh, sorry, earth fault detection on the PV array side. So in this case, we've got to detect that, that earth fault here. And so that's um, V1 could be up to 120 volts or above, uh, whereas V2 is going to be at the battery voltage. 
So let's – one last drawing before we um, start talking about some actual product is just to introduce this concept of what's known as decisive – voltage classifications. Now, decisive voltage classifications comes from the IEC. The IEC 62109 uh, standard for part one uh, is for uh, MPPTs and charge controllers and part two for inverters. Introduce this concept of uh, different classifications at different DC voltages and it's a hazard risk assessment. So uh, you could say A is the lowest risk and C is the highest risk. What we've done with our standards in Australia, we've deemed uh, for battery systems that are greater than 60 volts, therefore 60 volts upwards uh, are deemed to be equivalent to an LV installation. Therefore, as far as um, our uh, licensing and mechanical protection and insulation and a whole bunch of other things, uh, we deem this to be effectively an LV system uh, on the battery port. So that means that now... Um, a 61 volt battery being over 60 volts is an equivalent to an LV installation and requires uh, an earth fault alarm on the battery port. It requires double insulation on the cables. Uh, it requires a, a mechanical protection as per an LV cable. So that's been a big change. So that's just a little explainer about um, DVCs. Now I'll just come back to to the main screen. So look, I've got a return guest today and uh, uh, this, I'll just bring him in. Okay, Peter, g'day. Hey Glenn, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks Peter. Um, so Peter's from AERL and uh, we had a little chat some weeks or months ago now uh, about the history yes. of AERL, didn't we? We did. Uh, we had a really good conversation uh, on one of your uh, earlier tech toolboxes. Yeah, we did indeed. Now, I'm managing a few buttons here, so there might be a little bit of clipping off of my voice as I try and mute myself when, whenever Peter speaks. We discovered we were in our little uh, pre-tech that there was a little bit of a, um, an audio loop going back to him, so I have to press a mute button. But um, So just uh, tell us a bit about our AERL before we launch into talking about the products. Uh, sure, AERL is a, a renewable energy uh, power electronics company uh, based uh, here in Brisbane, Australia. Um, and we've been designing power electronics for remote applications now for over 35 years. Um, one of our, what our, cl our claim to fame, I guess, is the fact that we um, developed the original MPPT. Uh, it's the first commercialized MPPT back in 1984, um, which is in line with the sort of the founding of the company. Um, and to this day, we still make some uh, some pretty tonka tough MPPTs, amongst other things. Ah, uh, cool. So, um, look, I've got a really more important question based on our last um, uh, just uh, live event. Was uh, where is your cat? <laughs> uh, far away. He will not be interrupting uh, this this particular live stream. <laughs> Yeah, some cats have a, a um, pre pre predilection for walking in front of cameras across keyboards and cutting off your connection. Yes, uh, yes, they do. <laughs> or breaking things. <laughs> so, um, look, without further ado, let's um, talk a bit about the uh, SRX and, and the EarthGuard product. Um, I've got a couple here right next to me, and I'm going to do my very first, I think it's almost my first, unboxing. Uh, so I'll just bring you on full screen, and you can talk about it, and I'll just get it ready to unbox. So here we go. <laughs> sure. Tell yep, us about the SRX, please. Okay, so the SRX is a 300 volt um, open circuit capable um, MPPT uh, designed and manufactured here in Australia. Um, this is the latest generation ARL um, charge controller. Um, it's got all the bells and whistles you'd expect from a high end uh, premium quality MPPT. Um, we, we released it in uh, late 2019, um, first generation, um, and we've been making um, and they're probably be quite the, the uh, quite the good little unit. Okay. Well, look, I'm going to 
It's so big. This is the box. Um, I'm just going to take it out of the box and then put it on the table where um, you can see it with the overhead camera a bit better. But um, it's not super heavy. I'm just sitting in a chair a bit awkwardly. Uh, so, look, it comes with beautiful packaging. Um, there's something for the cat to play with. And uh, the all-important uh, installation instructions, make sure you read that. Uh, I think there's even an acronym for people who call you up who haven't read the manual. Is that right? Ah, uh, I can neither confirm nor deny this. <laughs> and uh, oh, we've got a little slip of paper in here. It's probably a thank you. Oh, there we go. Look, a warranty. Well, a three-year warranty um, from the original purchase. Uh, and uh, you are the original purchaser. And register your warranty online within 60 days. You get five years warranty. So that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Five mm -hmm. years warranty uh, if you register online which uh, is pretty damned easy to do. So let me just bring the beastie out of the box. There it is. And um, there we go. So that is one beautiful looking piece of equipment. Yes, and you may you may notice that it is, uh, if you were to put it up against sort of some of the comparable MPPTs on the market, that it's quite a bit larger. Um, so I, I feel like that's probably that's probably worth addressing actually while you've got it there and you're holding it. Um, there's two reasons for that primarily. Um, one, it has a higher input voltage, um, so we have to account for the extra heat load um, because the higher the input voltage, or the greater the differential between the PV and battery, really, um, the more thermal uh, losses you'll have. Um, and the second thing um, is we like our electronics to run very cool, uh, so you can you can sort of cut costs and skimp on heat sink sizes. Um, it, but we, we tend to like, because we design our electronics to last a very long time um, and they go into very mission critical remote applications, uh, we can't afford to have any anything that's going to sort of make them wear out or degrade. Uh, it, if it's avoidable, we, we, we like to avoid it. Um, so that's why that we went for such a large heat sink on that thing and it just runs so damn cool, which is great for longevity. Well, it's Going to put it down because it's also a little bit heavy. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah, so um, so there's the beastie, and uh, it's got a beautiful screen, which of course you can't see. Um, it's a colour screen, and it's a touch screen. Now I've got a I've got a bit of a funny story, which Peter knows all about. Um, uh, when he first sent me one of these, I said, "How do I program this thing? There's no buttons anywhere." <laughs> Yes. I think you eventually worked it out, though. <laughs> well, I hope you did. <laughs> Is this that you're sort of ahead of the curve, really, using a touchscreen on uh, an MPPT? Oh, look, it made sense. Um, no one likes the little finicky buttons on the front of the machine to try and program them. And back in the days um, when we first came up with the concept, uh, smartphone adoption just wasn't at the same level as it was now. Um, so you really couldn't, you know, having a Bluetooth uh, commissioning method, uh, which wasn't viable at the time. Um, but yes, yeah, smartphone adoptions come a long way in a very short period of time. Um, so that's now an alternative, but we still like the screen because, you know, customers can, you know, well, actually the end user, it's great for commissioning, makes it a very quick process. Uh, but the end user can just quickly check the state of their batteries and that sort of thing without having to navigate through finicky menus or anything like that, which is generally we have really good feedback on. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, speaking of cool, um, we, well, which is the Cool Max, we've got one more product coming up here, which is um, kind of the main mm. reason for today, uh, the EarthGuard. Now, let me just grab that. Another lovely box, um, somewhat lighter and smaller. So, uh, <laughs> and Absolutely. It, yes, and it also has something for the cat to play with. Mm -hmm. That's that's mandatory on all our uh, shipments. <laughs> and we've got uh, the the installation operation manual. Um, we've got a warranty document, which no doubt. 
Peter knows all about, but I'll just check it here because I haven't had a look at it. And it's the, the same condition. So it's a, a three-year warranty for the original purchaser, but an additional um, two years, so a total of five years warranty if uh, you register it online within 60 days. So yeah, five-year warranty on both products, basically, if you register them. So that's great. Thanks, Peter. No worries. <laughs> like to keep our, keep our warranties consistent over, across our product range so there's just no you don't have to wonder <laughs> makes things all simple. right so let's delve into the box now um ooh, wonder what that is i'll find out in a second and here we go here's the the main event the earth guard um so this is it the earth guard and i think if i hold it up to the camera you can probably see it um camera seems to like to focus on me so i'll bring it back a bit so there you go <laughs> Yes, it uh, looks remarkably similar to the um, uh, to the SRX. You might might have noticed. <laughs> I'll just put them together. Actually, uh, now what's what what's this box? Ah, well, that would be um, uh, all the fun bits and pieces that come with the Earth Guard. So you'll find in there that there's an industrial grade uh, USB C power supply. Um, as well as the ca uh, cable glands um, for actually installing the device. So we've got a, um, a USB-C industrial grade power supply. Um, it's going straight onto my Raspberry Pi. Thanks. Uh, and <laughs> it's a 15 watt charger. Actually, originally specced for the Raspberry Pi. So there you go. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, the Pi 4 is pretty power hungry. Uh, and we've got mm. some compression glands here uh, for cable entry points. Yep, that's it. Um, I feel like I should actually clarify too. The reason that we went for a USB supply on this particular device uh, is because it's doing DC earth fault protection, uh, detection. Um, it, the power supply for the device needs to be isolated from the system that it's testing. Um, which is, uh, if by powering off AC, you can actually, you know, um, you can disconnect the PV array and basically keep the AC inverter on to actually power the device while you're troubleshooting and all that sort of stuff. So we figured it was kind of actually had a multi-purpose benefit there. Um, and it's just quite easy and straightforward to use. Ah, okay. That, that makes total sense. So I understand why it's got a, a USB as opposed to an AC supply. Mm. Yeah. So it's pretty simple to connect by the look of it. You've just got DC positive, DC negative, and earth. And is that going to a battery or a PV array, or does it matter? So they're installed on the battery. It's for either 48 volt or 120 volt battery systems. Um, and yeah, it just gets wired straight onto the battery bus. So it looks pretty much the same as the unit. Let me just line them up on my overhead here. Yes, there's a pretty good reason for that, actually. Yeah, what's, what's the reason? Okay, so uh, when you install an earth guard with one of our controllers, um, and if, for example, if you install, yeah, it requires that the the Coolmax um, is installed. Um, but if it is installed with the rear entry ports, you can remove the top plate of the Earth Guard and the cable gland um, glands out of the base of the SRX. And then they actually there's a recess on the Earth Guard, and then they just nicely slot into each other. So it looks like one long unit when it's actually mounted on the wall. Um, so. I That's gotcha, like I like. gotcha. So, yeah, I can see um, if I take this top plate off here with the four Phillips head screws, then this mm -hmm. whole unit slides straight over the top and becomes effectively one unit. That's right, yes. Very nice, very nice, very clean. That's great. Okay, well, um, let me just move these aside. Oh, those heat sinks are sharp. I should have had my gloves on, not my bling on. But yeah, they're, they're uh, quite yes, sharp, aren't be they? Careful with those. <laughs> sharp edges dissipate heat better, though, so that's a good thing. They do, but there's a fine line between too sharp. <laughs> Maybe that's something we need to improve on. <laughs> okay, so um, I've got a few questions for you. Now, uh, 
first up is there's a requirement in the standard. Now, I've got uh, some of the clauses in front of me for all the clause buffs here. Uh, so mm -hmm. the the requirement in 5033 was the first that introduced the earth fault alarm requirement, and uh, it was for LV arrays, and that meant anything over 120 volts DC um, at uh, under any operating conditions. So even the coldest conditions you're required uh, to measure what the maximum open circuit voltage was. That's, so we introduced it with 5033. But more interestingly, we then introduced it with the new battery standard, 5139, with this um, strange clause which said, uh, you shall install an earth fault alarm unless no product is available on the market. Uh, so have you really cornered the market then? Uh, look, uh, yes, in a sense. Um, I mean, it's it's been a few years since that original standard release now, and just no one re had really um, bothered to actually bring something to market that was suitable for PV and battery applications. Um, and then it became an even more of a requirement with 5139 that we figured, okay, we need to actually do this and bring an Earthfall um, product to the market because otherwise it's going to eventually impact the sales of our MPPTs uh, because it is a requirement and it's just it's, you start to get into liabilities and that sort of thing on that it just gets a bit questionable um, and we kind of had a pretty good idea how to do it so we thought well let's uh, let's build an earth fault alarm and <laughs> make it happen Actually, a little correction on my behalf. Sorry, you were right. It was 5033 that introduced uh, the requirement initially with the uh, ex exemption if no product was available. But as soon as a product mm, is available, you, you were required to do it. So that, But that was the 120 volt kind of point was where we deemed it re a requirement, which with um, you know, MPPTs generally is about the three panel mark. You hit going over 120 volts these days. So uh, it, it didn't take long for uh, it to, to trigger on most installations. Um, but then with the battery standard, we lowered that hazardous voltage to 60 volts and also required it to detect um, uh, an earth fault alarm, uh, earth fault on the battery port side. Now, is that more, any different? Is it more difficult? Is it the same test? Uh, and it's well the way we designed the earth guard uh, as I said earlier it's actually mounted on the battery bus um, so because of the fact that it's required on non galvanically isolated products um, that often do have a common positive or a common negative connection through uh, we're actually able to we, we realize that from a central point in the system that we can actually tackle both the battery ground fault and the PV ground fault uh, detection at once um, because effectively it's all just one big circuit um, so that's what we did, and we figured we could just kill two birds with one stone and design a product that was actually, you know, that monitors the entire system from that central location, um, which is the major benefit of the Earth Guard over any other sort of. Because uh, there's, there's a couple of earth fault or leakage detectors on the market at the moment, um, and they they're really designed for things like rail applications and a bunch of other um, industry specific. Uh, application so nothing was really designed for PV um, so it's yeah it's it, it really uh, and honestly if you were to use something like that on your system it, you generally end up requiring one per array um, so and with the earth guard you just have one box that gets wired into the central onto the battery bus and you can have as many MPPTs in the system as you want um, so it's a really it basically it bought the uh, the cost of DC systems or DC coupled systems back to earth uh, because of the, with uh, without the earth guard it was going to be a very expensive proposition um, once it was a requirement. Great. Okay, so um, I was just fiddling with the controls here to see if there's any questions. Um, <laughs> feel free, everyone, to – I've now got uh, the ability to see both um, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter comments coming through. So feel free to, to throw some comments at me or even just, you know, thumbs up so you're enjoying the, uh, the live stream um, and, uh, uh, you know, subscribe. If you're on one of those channels where you subscribe, that would be great. But let's go back to this product. Uh, you're welcome to, to mention products, Peter, but there are a couple of products on the market that do have ground fault detection. Um, and we had a little chat before the show, and you said that they don't really comply with Australian standards. Can you explain what they are and why they don't comply? Yeah, absolutely. So you may have seen that uh, a couple of the more common um, regulators and MPPTs on the market, uh, like the 
uh, the 300 volt outback for example as well as the uh what is it the morning star mppt um they also both have uh ground fault detection built in but this is not specifically designed for the australian market where we install uh with floating P we install floating pv here it's not functionally earthed uh so the the morning star and the outback units they do have ground fault detection actually the sharded does too they have ground fault detection built in but it's only for positive or negatively functionally earthed systems so if the positive or negative in the system is actually directly connected to earth um if everything's floating uh that the ground fault detection isn't it doesn't work um because that's not what it's designed for the u.s market is um it's predominantly functional earth thing over there over there so that's what they expect their devices out for being u.s products all right, I'll just do a little bit of translation there. So um, in the US, <laughs> they refer to um, ground instead of earth. So you'll see ground fault detection used in US products. Um, we talk about earth fault detection. And as Peter as Peter pointed out, um, the, uh, the methodology used in the US assumes that you have a functionally earthed system because it's a requirement of the National Electrical Code. Whereas in Australia, that's a very unusual design. Um, you are allowed to do it, but there's a whole bunch of requirements too. You actually need what's called a ground fault interrupter if you have a functionally earthed system uh, in Australia. Uh, so that's a different, a different kettle of fish, generally done with a fuse or something similar. Um, but, uh, oh, I can just see some questions coming in. So before I babble on a bit too much, I'm going to just throw up a question. So I'll bring that on screen. Here we go. So this one's from Jeff Bragg. Um, he's a friend of mine. He's also the uh, president of SEIA and uh, uh, in New South Wales. I think you still are, Jeff, and also a board member of the Smart Energy Council. Now, Jeff's asking, do you need an earth guard on a battery port side of an SP Pro? So I think I can sort of answer this one um, Jeff, so it depends on the voltage of the battery. So if the battery is above 60 volts under for more than 0.2 of a second, under any operating conditions, uh, yes, you do need uh, an earth fault detection on that system if it's not galvanically isolated from the PV array. So it depends on what source of PV charging you have connected to that battery. If it's AC charging from a galvanically isolated um, SP Pro, then, uh, then you don't have uh, that potential for the earth fault uh, because it's galvanically isolated. But if it's charged through an MPPT, uh, then you, you do. Now, do you confer, Peter? Uh, yes, so pretty much um, a 48 volt uh, SP Pro that's AC coupled. Um, the PV inverters generally take care of the uh, earth fault detection on the PV side and because of the fact the SP Pro is galvanically isolated, uh, it's not required on the battery side. Uh, but uh, Selectronic make a 120 volt uh, inverter as well um, and it is required on that, um, that, uh, that unit because of the fact it is above 60 volts. Great. Okay, we've got another question here. This one's from Quentin. Quentin says, uh, so is, I presume he's referring to the EarthGuard product, is it compatible with other brand MPPTs to retrofit to an existing system? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, while it is designed to integrate with the Coolax, um, it's a neat little package. Uh, we're pretty agnostic about what you can use it with. Um, so it, it's a standalone product and you can use it on basically any other MPPT out there that requires it. Great. So it actually solves a problem for other manufacturers. Um, yes. uh, have you tested it with other manufacturers? Yes, we have. Uh, we've done pretty extensive testing at this point. Um, uh, there's not a whole lot of products left out there that we haven't actually given it a whirl with. Uh, so it's, yeah, we've got pretty good compatibility across the range. And we've got a slightly oblique question here from Bradley. G'day, Bradley. Um, <laughs> you're one of my, my solid Sunday fans. You're often there uh, <laughs> watching, I notice. Uh, so Bradley is asking um, battery voltage range. What battery voltage range does the EarthGuard and the SRX work with? Okay, so it's, uh, it's designed specifically at the moment for 48 volt and 120 volt. Um, and up to 300 volts on the system voltage, maximum system voltage. So in the event of an earth fault, um, the device can handle up to 300 volts. Um, so that's kind of specced around our existing hardware with our uh, chargers. Um, 
but we may look at doing a higher voltage uh, earth guard at some point down the future if if that's where the market goes but um, for now it's yeah 48 and 124. Great Thank, thanks for that question Bradley. More broadly, um, I've got some other questions here, which is more about just um, using DC coupled solutions. Why would a solar mm -hmm. designer or installer choose to DC couple a solar array to a battery as opposed to using uh, an AC coupled solution? Okay, there's a couple of reasons there. Um, there is quite significant restrictions for one around inverter sizing, grid connected inverter sizing. So if you're doing a grid connected battery backup system, uh, you're going to run out of charging capacity very quickly, but those same sizing restrictions don't apply to DC coupled. Um, so you can basically, you can get around sort of grid um, restrictions just by DC coupling the battery storage. Um, now, in terms of on a more technical level, um, there is definitely significant benefits to DC coupling uh, because of the fact that it's you're doing DC to DC battery charging as opposed to AC to DC uh, battery charging, which is... Uh, generally not the cleanest form of DC once it's been um, converted back from AC to DC so it, it tends to have still, still some of that AC ripple in it um, which can cause heating in batteries um, and effectively if you're charging if or if you're running if you're charging them very hard um, with an inverter charger uh, you can fairly drastically shorten the lifespan of the battery system um, by AC coupling exclusively um, now this was a major, uh, it's quite a significant problem with lead acid chemistries, um, but the so it's, it's the uh, the court's still a little bit out in, in terms of what effect um, that AC couple ri uh, coupled ripple charging has on um, lithium battery chemistries. Um, but we're doing that research at the moment in our laboratory in Brisbane, so we'll have some better ideas uh, on that subject shortly. All right. Okay. Oh, so you're doing R and D on uh, Ripple. I hadn't wasn't aware of that. That's really interesting. Mm. Uh, so I've got another question. This one's from Simon. Let's just bring it up on screen. So Simon Parker asks, "What is the cost of the Earth Guard in Australia? Are you happy to talk about pricing?" Uh yeah. Sure. Why not? Um, it's pretty standard across the range. Um, so they are uh, five twenty five plus GST. Um, that's trade pricing, of course, um, which I figure probably applies to most people watching this stream. Um, but again, it's uh, there is a discount as well if you if you we do subsidise the cost when you purchase them together with a Coolmax. Um, so that's another option if you, if you're interested in using our charges. Um, that that brings down the overall system cost just a little bit. Um, but yeah, they're five twenty five plus GST on their own. Great. Okay. So everyone, feel free to throw some more questions into the chat. Um, I'm, this is working well for me. I can actually see the questions quite clearly because uh, the previous uh, Toolbox Tech Talk, I had to jump around different screens to try and read the questions. But um, using, I'll give a little plug to the software I'm using, by the way. It's a company called Ecamm Live. Um, this is their new uh, beta version with what they call Interview, uh, where I can do what I'm doing now, which is bring guests in. In fact, I can bring up to four guests uh, on screen at the same time. It's even got this cool function called the green room where I can just chuck Peter into the green room he can listen and watch but we can't hear him he can't uh, speak but uh, it's kind of a nice a nice way of doing um, a, a live event so just going back to our, my list of questions here um, uh, we've covered on the the different ways that other manufacturers do earth fault detection which is not compatible with our Australian standards um, is, oh yeah, what's new about the SRX? It's had a long history and it's changed its form factor significantly since um, you know the earlier um, models that I've seen. Uh, what, what's what's changed with the SRX? Okay, so the SRX, um, we're we're always <laughs> we can't help ourselves. We like to keep improving things. Um, but you, the previous SRX that you would have had there at the Smart Energy Lab would have been a Generation One. It was a very early one. Um, I think it was probably serial number six or around that. Um, but uh, this this one is a generation two SRX. So it, if I mean from the outside, it looks a little bit. Uh, it looks relatively similar. Albeit it's it's a more polished product overall. Um, but inside, it's, it's significantly different. You'll see that when you go to install it. Um, but there's been a whole bunch of hardware improvements and upgrades. Um, it's it runs cooler. It's 
slightly more efficient. Um, it's just yeah, it's an all round better product than the Generation One SRX. Uh, speaking of efficiency, do you, do you know what the efficiency of the unit, unit is? Uh, yes, it's. I think the MV1 um, is about ninety eight point six percent. Um, but that's because we've got 300 volt input going down to 48, so we lose a little bit there. Um, but the 120 volt one is is up over 99. percent uh, Wow, 99 percent efficient. That's just just insane. I, I guess there's not much space to go, is there? Uh, you're not going to get 101 percent. <laughs> no, no, you're definitely not. Um, that, that probably defies the laws of physics. <laughs> All right, we've got another question here uh, from the uh, from an anonymous Facebook user. So just bring that one on. Uh, is AC ripple reduced if you have both AC and DC arrays on the same battery? Um, it's heavily dependent on charging capacity. So if it's charging on the AC system, it's going to have AC ripple in there. Um, the only way to reduce your AC ripple in the system is predominantly charge with DC and size your daytime loads for the AC. Um, which is personally what I think is the best way to do it because then you're charging the batteries with really smooth, clean DC um, for nighttime loads and the AC is being fed straight to the house for AC loads, which makes a lot of sense if, in my opinion. Hope you muted. Ooh, nearly did it. Um, a combination of both AC and DC coupling uh, is actually a winning combination. Um, I mean, I, I often think of it for off-grid as uh, your protection against your AC coupling not working whenever you have a black event. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this terminology, um, if you've got a fully AC coupled off-grid system, so you've got a um, solar inverter that outputs AC, you've got a battery inverter that it couples to on the AC bus, and if the battery inverter goes down, like you've discharged the battery overnight and it shuts down, even when the sun comes up in the morning, no charge is going to come in because that battery inverter has to form a grid to which the solar inverter synchronizes with. And uh, if it's turned off, it won't synchronize with anything and you won't charge your battery. And that's why DC coupling is really the most reliable way, um, independent way of ensuring a battery gets charged from a renewable source. It's just going to do it when the sun comes up. And it may be really a small system even, but it's going to protect that battery from uh, staying discharged and um, possible call-outs. Uh, how do you feel about that description? That's pretty damn accurate. Yeah, that's, that's one of the other great benefits of DC coupling. Okay. Um, I think I've run through my questions. I've covered the cat. That's good. Um, yeah, and <laughs> we've, we've looked at... <laughs> We've looked at the SRX and, and EarthGuard and we've uh, differentiated between ground fault um, detection requirements in our Australian standards versus um, the National Electrical Code of the US, which is different requirements. Um, I should point out that you can functionally earth systems in Australia as well, but it's very uncommon to do this. Um, there's no real advantage to it. You could say it's all disadvantages. Uh, it's it's kind of inherently less safe, but there is some applications where functional earthing um, for not for power generation but for other purposes makes makes some sense and I think you make a product that specifically does this uh, don't you Peter yeah we do um, so we we actually make something that uh, is effectively a big earth fault um, but it's an intentional earth fault for uh, for protecting metallic structures so we're pumping DC current um, through a metallic structure down to an, into an anode bed um, to protect it from corrosion. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a challenge to work out how the hell we do earth fault detection on that system because technically it actually does fall under the uh, the PV standard if it's a PV powered uh, cathodic protection system. So that was a fun little uh, experiment we had to do. <laughs> but you, you with a functionally earth system, you have the additional requirement of a ground fault interrupter. So not yes. just detection. That's correct. The circuit has to be broken because it's you, with a floating earth, you have two points of failure. Uh, with a and, and the earth guard will pick that up. So it'll pick up when the first point of failure is degrading. Uh, it'll trigger the alarm before there's actually any serious risk or current flowing to earth. Um, whereas with a functional earth system, you only have one point of failure. You've already got one pole that's directly earth, so you only need the other one uh, to break down, and you've got the short to earth. Um, so it's which is why it needs to be interrupted. 
Yeah, gotcha. Um, would it work on a vehicle? I had a friend who had a, um, a Land Rover, and you had to, it was always corroding all the because it's aluminium body, and uh, so he went and bought some expensive thing at um, you know uh, um, one of those aftermarket shops that supposedly did cathodic protection and injected some current into it. I don't know where he got it from. Um, could he put a PV panel on the roof of his uh, four wheel drive and and do cathodic protection? I don't know if it would work on something that's got rubber tires. Um, <laughs> that's that's going to be one I'll have to look into. I got, I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. Maybe it's a new market. Is uh, cathodic protection on um, those aluminium cars that might be coming out one day? Yes, or any of the four-wheel drives that are already existing. <laughs> Uh, fun fact: uh, He actually lived at Coolum, so where you are right now. So uh, salt, salt mist. Oh, there you air. go. There you go. Yes. All right. Well, um, look, we've been having a nice chat here, and uh, I think we've covered all the material I wanted to. But I've got a couple of plugs, so I might just say farewell to Peter and just um, wind up the show with just a, a, a few uh, end um, announcements. So, thanks very much, Peter. Absolutely, uh, Glenn. Thanks for having me. It's great, great to be here. Okay, well, I'll send you back to the green room and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Cool. So, yeah, that was Peter Watkinson from AERL. I've known Peter for a long time and I love the products and thanks very much for sending them to me here at the Smart Energy Lab. For those who are not familiar with what I do, I run training courses like this online, um, live, one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-on-several. Uh, almost every other week. So this week coming up, I'm doing a three-day course just for electrical inspectors. Well, it's not just for electrical inspectors. Uh, it's actually for anyone uh, interested in the very detailed um, aspects of our renewable energy standards, specifically uh, 5033 for PV arrays, 5139 for battery systems, and 4777 part one for inverter systems connected to the utility grid. So we'll be doing that on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, starting at 7.30 each morning for four hours. So you can enroll in my courses online, uh, solarquip.com. Just go to solarquip.com and you can find those courses. Then a couple of weeks later, I'm doing a five-day solar and battery design course. It's similarly four hours a day. These are all delivered via Zoom, by the way. So um, it's a you know classroom environment. You're all on screen together. Generally, it's just um, you know 10 to 12 people, uh, and we will be discussing uh, and um, sharing information. I'll be explaining stuff, but also in those courses, I give homework. So for the design course, you get to design and build uh, a theoretical model for a solar and battery storage system to meet a certain load energy requirement. So it's all based on our uh, standard for standalone power systems 4509 uh, part 2 for design and part 1 for installation but we also cover hybrid systems as well so we look at um, the requirements for designing a hybrid system and some of the compliance issues for that so that's like a five day course um, but it's only every morning uh, from I think it's 8.30 till 12.30 so it's half day courses with a bit of homework as well Anyway, so that's my plug for my training courses and thanks everyone for coming and watching this live. Uh, I'll be back next Sunday for another Toolbox Tech Talk at 2pm. So until then, see you mate. Bye.